Hey guys, so I hope everybody you are able to hear me out. Can you hear me? Can you give me a confirmation? Am I audible? Is my voice audible? Just give me a quick confirmation. Hit like if you are new to the channel. Hit subscribe, definitely. And then we will just start in another two to three minutes everyone yeah please do let me know whether you are able to hear me out quickly press the bell notification icon so that you get all the notification as we go ahead yeah perfect hit like yes so definitely today we are going to have an amazing session we'll just start in another two three minutes and then we'll start uh what all things we have learnt yesterday if you have attended the live session. Just let me know what all things we have basically learnt. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We'll wait for some time. Till then you can share the video with everyone so that everybody comes live. Because these all are community sessions and I'm going to spend a good amount of time today uh, wherein we'll focus on understanding so many different concepts in deep learning. Right? Perfect. Is my voice louder? Yes. I hope my voice is also louder, right? If you want more noise, let me know. Then we will try to understand things, okay? Okay. So, another one minute and then we'll start. But I hope everybody is doing fine. And I today is Eid also. I know today is a holiday, but thought, why not share some knowledge today also, right? So... Uh, we'll be checking out so many topics today. So let me just share my screen. So here is what was the yesterday's thing we discussed and it was quite big like we discussed the overall functionality of the entire uh, you know neural network how it works and uh, what all things we had actually done. Okay. And, and that is how uh, you know many of you basically got clarified your queries and doubts and uh, yeah uh, today we'll be learning some more extra things okay so let me clear the screen and i hope everybody has enrolled into the free dashboard link that is given in the description uh, please go ahead over there all the materials and video links are given over there so that anytime you probably require the materials and all you can basically get that and uh, we can learn together you know at till the end of the day it will be available with you all okay so let's continue uh, so today is the day two i've cleared the screen and let me write today is the day two of deep learning session so deep learning and what is the agenda that we are going to cover today Number one, the agenda. Uh, we'll go again, we'll get an idea about forward propagation. Okay. Then uh, we will understand, uh, before understanding the loss functions, we will first of all understand chain rule of derivatives. chain rule of derivatives okay we'll understand this and then we'll also be getting an idea about many things as such so about chain rule of derivatives or differentiation which is a very important topic uh, materials is already uploaded in the dashboard let me check it out guys i think i've seen the materials okay so let me quickly check out all the materials are there or not. Mm. 
yeah materials are available guys check out in the resource section everything is given over there okay so i have also checked it out so not a worries with respect to any kind of materials in the resource section it is available then after completing chain rule of derivatives we are going to understand a very important problem which is called as vanishing gradient problem okay so we are going to understand about vanishing gradient problem the fourth thing that we are going to understand uh, is basically about loss functions what are the different types of loss functions so in this session we are going to cover all these things okay and uh, we are going to cover in an efficient manner wherein i will probably write each and everything in front of you and we'll try to complete this in two hours of time okay so let's go ahead and let's first of all again go back to the basics uh, whatever we think we learned yesterday so suppose this is my neural network with three inputs and i have one neuron in the hidden layer and finally one neuron in the uh, output layer right so this becomes my input x1 x2 x3 let's say this is my x1 x2 x3 and this in further will get connected to our hidden neuron okay and finally this goes to my output layer okay so this is my hidden layer one hidden layer one and this is my output layer just to add one more thing uh, we have something called as bias bias also gets added and bias also gets added in each and every hidden layer okay so uh, and then what we do we get basically y hat and then we define our loss function my loss will nothing be it will be the difference between y and y hat and our main aim is to reduce this loss value so what we do first step is basically the forward propagation in the forward propagation we assign different weights these weights are assigned randomly and there are various ways to assign the weights which we will be having a look onto it okay and then finally i go to w4 which is another weight over here whatever output is basically coming from here it will go over here and finally it will go to the output layer this inputs are basically your data points which i have already discussed yesterday okay and over here two things basically happen in every neuron first i will say y is equal to it is nothing but summation of w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 and then a bias gets added over here and after that we have something called as an activation function will get applied on top of it which i will specifically write as z so let's come consider this is the symbol that i'm using as an activation function one activation function that we have already seen is something called as sigmoid activation function we will also see different kinds of activation functions today okay sigmoid activation function main aim is that we try to convert this y value uh, as 0 or 1 okay so whenever it is greater than or 0 0.5 we get it as 1 if it is less than 0 0.5 we get it as 0 so till yesterday we had discussed all these things uh this y can also be given by another symbol which is nothing but w transpose x plus b okay and this is nothing but a linear regression in short but because of the activation function we basically get non-linear properties okay we are able to solve non-linear problems so till here we have basically discussed okay all the resource link will be given in the description perfect now uh, let's go ahead and let's try to understand i hope everybody has understood this specific thing usually happens in the forward propagation right so this is what happens in the forward propagation in every layer right in every layer the forward propagation basically happens right now once i get my output that is y hat and then we calculate our loss function now what will happen in order to reduce the loss function how will we be able to reduce the loss function okay that is what uh, we are going to understand now in in order to reduce the loss we really need to update this weights right we really need to update this weights and this updation of the weights usually happen in the back propagation okay and how the weights are getting updated that is what we are going to see 
So let's go to the back propagation second step, which we are specifically going to discuss about back propagation. Here in this back propagation, we will see two things. One is weight updation formula. Weight updation formula. The second thing that we are probably going to see uh, in the weight updation formula is that uh, how, what is the chain rule of differentiation? Chain rule of differentiation. So this is what we are going to cover. This is both the topics we will be covering. Now let's let me again define this entire things. Now over here, let's say I have three inputs and one hidden neuron and one output neuron. Right? This all will be interconnected. Right? Now over here, this is my input. This is my weights W1, W2, W3. Let's say this weight is W4 and finally I get my output. This output is nothing but my y hat, right? Then I calculate in my loss y minus y hat. And my, in order to reduce this loss, what we do, we have to update this weight. So the weight updation formula, and that is where optimizers will also come, okay? Optimizers will be very much useful when we are actually doing chain rule of differentiation. Now, suppose I want to update this weight W4. How this weights gets updated? Forward propagation, I hope everybody is clear, right? Now in the backward propagation, the main aim is that we have to update this weight. So here I'm just going to write backward propagation. Okay. Now in the backward propagation, we need to update weights W4, W1, W2, W3. Now how this weight updation will happen? So here I'm going to write the weight updation formula. Weight updation formula. The weight updation formula is very, very simple. I will write a generic formula. I'll say W new. W new basically means the weight that is getting updated is nothing but W old. W old basically means the previous weight because in the forward propagation, this weight will have a different value. And when we do the back propagation, we need to update this. So previous weight, whatever it was, minus learning rate derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old so i will be discussing about each and every parameters over here this parameter that you see is nothing but it is a learning rate i'll talk about the importance of learning rate just in some time but the first important thing that we really need to understand is this value okay so what is this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old okay so this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old is nothing but it is basically calculating the slope okay we are basically trying to calculate the slope now when we are calculating this slope i hope everybody has learned linear regression right in linear regression also what we do we update we update the weights or coefficient, right? So I hope everybody have learned in the simple linear regression. I've also made live sessions on machine learning also for the same. Now in this case, what happens is that we basically get this kind of curve and this is basically called as gradient descent. This gradient descent is nothing but it is the graph with respect to weights and the loss function. Okay, weights and the loss function. Now, in this graph, this point that you probably see, this point is basically called as global minima. This point is basically called as global minima. When we are training and updating the weights, we definitely have to come to this particular point. Okay. Anyhow, it may be at this point or it may be at this point, but anyhow, we have to come into this particular point. Now, why this formula will definitely work? That is what we are going to understand first of all. Okay. Suppose let's say that I have one point over here. Initially, let's say with respect to W, any weights, the previous weights, I got a loss function which is coming at this point. Okay. Here I've I've actually drawn a 2D diagram, but this usually looks like a 3D curve. Okay. 3D curve. Just imagine that uh, there is a mountain and we have inverted that mountain, right? So in that way, this will be like a 3D curve. Okay. And our main aim is basically to come to this specific point. Okay. 
Now, during this 3D curve, let's say that first point comes over here. Now, when we apply this derivative of loss with respect to this weight at this specific point, in short, what we are actually doing is that we are basically creating a tangent line. And based on this tangent line, we basically find out the slope. Slope, we actually find out like this. Now, this is basically my loss function. This is my weights, okay? Now, when we try to find out the slope, now the first thing we need to understand whether this is a positive slope or negative slope. And how do you determine this? Obviously, through calculation, we will definitely get it, uh, get it as a positive or negative slope. But one very important thing that you should definitely be knowing is that whenever the right side of the line, see, whenever this right side of the line is pointing downwards, okay, whenever this right side of the line is pointing downwards, then we should basically understand that this is a negative slope. Okay, negative slope. Now, when it is a negative slope, suppose if I go and point this weights over here, right, this is my weights. Now, my main target should be that I should be increasing this weight so that I move to this global minima. Okay, I should be moving to this global minima. Now, in order to do this, I have to increase the weight. And in this particular option, weight updation formula, either I can increase or decrease the weight. Okay, I can either increase or decrease the weight. So suppose in this particular case, I get a negative slope. Negative slope basically means some negative value. So my weight updation formula will now become, see what it will become, W new is equal to W old minus learning rate of some negative value in the case of negative slope. And in case of negative slope, you have already seen that I have to increase my weights. I have to increase this weights to come over here right that is what i am actually looking at now what will happen w old negative into negative will be a positive value right this positive value will be multiplied by learning rate multiplied by some positive value so here you know that at the end of the day what will happen my w new let me write it down over here my w new so this will be a positive value right my w new will be always greater than w old because I am adding the previous weights in this particular case. So whenever we have a negative slope, by this specific equation, it will definitely work because we are trying to increase the weights. And that is the reason why W new, when we are applying over here a negative slope, then it will become minus into minus, which will be nothing but positive. And when I probably add up this value, my W new will definitely be greater than W old. Okay. So definitely with the help of a negative slope, I'm able to increase the weights, which is basically what I want over here. Let's say in the case of this slope, suppose in this point, I go and draw a, I draw, I, I go and draw up a slope like this. Now in this particular case, what will be my slope? This will basically be a positive slope. How I'm saying? Because just see the right side, right hand side of the line. It is pointing upwards. Here it was pointing downwards. And if you do the calculation also of this particular slope, it will be a positive slope. Now, in this particular case, if I go and probably plot this W over here, I, in order to come over, I have to decrease this weight. I have to decrease this weight. Okay. Now, what will happen? The again formula. See, in this particular case, I'm getting a positive slope. Okay. If I put this positive slope in this equation, what will happen? Now, my W new will be w old minus learning rate of some positive value right of some positive value and when i probably subtract this with some positive value what will happen w new will be less than w old right this is what we it is proved so what was our main aim with respect to weights i should be able to increase or decrease the weights and that is what i am able to do it over here right so through this through this uh this is basically a gradient descent uh and this is basically happening from the loss function i will discuss about all the loss functions just going forward but just understand that in linear regression also whenever i plotted by using this loss function which i have actually used over here that is y minus y hat whole square at that point of time you'll be able to see if i plot with respect to weights and loss function i'll be getting this gradient descent 
and for back propagation how i am updating the formula this is the updation formula whereas w new is equal to w old minus learning rate of dl uh, derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old but now what is the importance of this learning rate we need to understand now see guys i need to come to this global minima my main aim is basically to come to this global minima and in order to come i can take larger step also i can take smaller step also right it is always a good practice that our learning rate should be a small number if it is a small number we will be slowly converging into the global minimum okay we will be slowly converging into the global minima if i probably take a larger number what happens if my learning rate is a larger number then it may be a problem sometime because my my this point weights points will be jumping here and there and it it may be a situation that it may never come to the global minima it will be jumping here and there so it is always a good practice that you take a learning rate as a smaller number the learning rate uh, that i usually take or any probably researchers usually take is somewhere around 0.001 or you can also take 0.01 right and this i will try to show you in the practical also okay so our main aim should be that we should slowly converge otherwise it may be a situation wherein i may never reach the global minima or not so i hope you are able to understand till here uh, please do hit like if you are able to understand and please do comment comment down some good messages if i can see you whether you are following or not okay so till here i hope everybody is able to understand with respect to the weight updation formula perfect now after the weight updation now you have understood this weight updation basically happens in this specific way and uh, you are able to clearly see that how the weight updation usually happens and what all things we are able to do with this and this is how in the back propagation we basically do it now let's take one very simple example and let's see the entire chain rule of differentiation now second point over here i told you about first point in back propagation first thing that happens is weight updation formula the second thing that basically happens is something called as chain rule of differentiation okay now let's go to the second point now in the second point i basically see something called as chain rule of differentiation okay now in the chain rule of differentiation what happens and what is this chain rule of differentiation we'll try to understand okay everybody has understood this so i am just going to copy this entire thing and probably just paste it over there so that i don't have to rework it okay now let's take this same diagram okay now you have understood what happens in the forward propagation and you have also understood the weight updation formula let me write the weight updation formula it is nothing but w old sorry w new is equal to w old minus learning rate multiplied by derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old okay so this is the formula perfect everybody has understood i guess now our main thing is that how this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old happens we need to understand okay let's say i want to find out the derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w4 w4 old okay i want to find out this so how w4 will get updated okay how how w4 will get updated so what i can write is that i can basically say w4 new is equal to w4 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w4 old okay so this is the formula for w4 whenever we try to update w4 right all the other values we can easily get it okay we can basically easily get it all the values like w4 old will be able to get it learning rate is initialized in initially but the question lies how do i find this value that is derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w old now derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w4 old here i will specifically use something called as chain rule of derivative now what is this chain rule of derivative in order to find out let's let's understand okay now chain rule of derivative is basically say since this is my loss right let me write it down over here let's say the output of this neuron is basically o1 the output of this neuron is basically o2 what is this output this multiplied by the weights is basically my output 
after applying an activation function. This inputs multiplied, this x1, x2, x3 multiplied by this added a bias and then activation function, I'll be getting an uh, output as O1. I hope that everybody's clear about because I've already covered it. Now, how to basically update this W4 with the help of chain rule, okay? I'll write down the equation over here, okay? Now, in order to in order to find out this, what I will write, I will say that derivative of loss, now loss is dependent on what? It is dependent on the O2 value, first of all. Okay, it is dependent on O2 because I need to update W4. So first of all, this loss is dependent on O2. So I can basically write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of O2. And then according to the chain rule, the next step that we will be going on, wherein O2 is now dependent on W4. So what I will write in further step is that derivative of O2 divided by derivative of W4. Now here, if I sub, if I just cross this two, okay, if I cross this two, then what will happen? I will be getting this only, right? This will be my W4 old. If I cross this two, because this also can be removed, right? And this is what chain rule of derivative basically means. There will be a chain that will be formed in order to calculate this derivative of loss, right? So this is one example of the chain rule to update W4. And what exactly is happening over here? We are basically trying to calculate the slope with respect to this particular derivative and we'll be able to get the answer, okay? Let me add one more step. What is O2? Let's say this is my Z input, okay? Z input is nothing but O1 multiplied by W4. And then we add a bias and then we add an activation function, right? We add a bias and then we add an activation function, right? So what is this Z? If I write, what is this Z? Z is nothing but it is an activation function applied to O1 W4 plus bias. I hope everybody is correct with this particular thing, right? I hope everybody is able to understand over here, right? O1 multiplied by W4 plus bias because here also bias will get added, right? Here also bias will get added. Here also bias will get added, right? Another bias. So this will be B1. This will be B2. And bias will also have the same updation formula like how weights are actually having, okay? So if I probably write the bias activation function, it will be nothing but B2 old is equal to, sorry, B2 new. It should be B2 new is equal to B2 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of b2 old right so this is the bias activation function sorry not bias activation this is the bias updation formula right bias uh updation formula and it, it is similar these two are almost similar for bias also it will happen for weights also it will happen okay so i hope everybody is able to understand till here right now what is our next step okay the next step is that, let's say I want to update this particular value of this weights, W1. So how I will go ahead? Let's see. Okay. So I will write derivative of, derivative of, let, let me write it down. So how it will be? I will basically write W1 new is equal to W1 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W1 old, right? This is the formula for updating W1. Yes, for updating W1, this is the formula. Now just try it from your side. You know, just pause the video and try it from your side that how will my chain rule work in this particular case? How will my chain rule work in this particular case when I am basically trying to find out the derivative of loss with respect to W1? So here, I'm just going to take this up, okay? I'm basically going to take this derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W1 old. Now, how I'm going to basically write this chain rule because for this only, this is my main concern, right? This is how I, I have to apply the chain rule in this particular equation, okay? So how will I go ahead? Now, let's go back, okay? Now, first step, you know that loss is dependent on O2. O2 is dependent on O1 and O1 is dependent on W1, okay? Now see, see the chain rule. Loss is first of all dependent on O2. So what I will write? I will basically write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of O2. Okay. First step, derivative of O2. Then I will multiply it over here. Okay. 
derivative of loss with respect to derivative of O2. Now, O2 is dependent on O1. You can see over here, right? Because O1 output is this one, O2 output is this one. So, in the next step, what I will write is that I will basically say derivative of O2 divided by derivative of O1, right? So, this step is also very much clear, okay? And the next step, what we are basically doing, O1 is now dependent on W1. You can see over here, O1, this O1 is dependent on W1, right? So now I will go ahead and write the next step. That is derivative of O1 divided by derivative of derivative of W1 volt, right? So this becomes my new chain rule of differentiation to update W1, right? To update W1, this becomes my different chain rule of differentiation, right? So I hope everybody is able to understand. Now just try it out with respect to W2. With respect to W2, what will be my eight up updation formula? So again, I will go and write over here W2 new is equal to W2 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W2 old. Okay, so this is my another formula. Now, how do I write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W2 old? Okay, how do I write? Okay. See, don't worry about W4. You may be thinking, where is W4? W4 can still be divided. See, this same thing, this o, derivative of O2 to derivative of O21 can also be done with chain rule like this. Derivative of W4 multiplied by derivative of W4 by derivative of O1. Yes. So, I hope everybody is able to understand. This L is nothing but loss. Right? Loss is dependent on that. Right. So like this, you can still more divide it since we are learning chain rule of differentiation. It can be expanded to any manner you want. But at the end of the day, you will be getting this specific thing only. Right. Now, let's see one more example. Let's say uh, I, I create a separate neural network. This neural network looks a little bit cubersome. OK, let's say in the first in I just have one input layer, one input neuron. OK, then I have one hidden neuron. Okay, then in the next hidden layer, I have two hidden neuron and in the third, in the final output, I have one hidden, uh, one neuron in the output layer. So when I combine this, this becomes at this shape. Okay. This becomes at this shape. Okay. And finally, I get my output. Okay. Now, let's say this is my X1. This is my W1. This is my W2. This is my W3. This is my W4. This is my W5 and finally, this is my output of this. So let's say I'll also write the output. This output is nothing but O11. This output is nothing but O21. This output is nothing but O22. And this output is nothing but O31. And then what happens? I get Y hat and then finally I get my loss. Okay. Now tell me if I want to update W1, how do I do it with the help of chain rule of differentiation? You have to try this. Okay. Pause the video. Pause the video, try it by, from your side. How will you update this W1 and what kind of chain rule of differentiation will look like it? Okay, so let me just show you. First of all, you try. I would suggest you try it by yourself and then come to a conclusion. Okay, so over here, I can basically write W1 old is equal to, sorry, it should be new again. I'm writing old. So W1 new is equal to W1 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w1 old this is the weight updation formula this everybody knows it okay but if we go to the next step how do we calculate derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w1 old now just understand the chain rule there are two roots that you can basically see over here the first root goes in this way Loss is dependent on O31, O31 is dependent on O21, O21 is dependent on O11, and O11 is dependent on W1. This is one root. So this is basically my one root, which I can actually go. And the other root is something this one. I have one more root that is basically dependent on this in order to update W1 because this all dependency is also there. So how do I go ahead? How do I combine these two things? Okay. How do I combine these two things? Okay. So Let's go and update this. Now, how do I write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of W1 old? First, I will take this path and find out the chain rule of differentiation. And then I will be adding this path. 
so when i combine both of them it is just like an or operation okay so let's go ahead so first of all let's go on the topmost path so here derivative of loss is dependent on o31 o31 is dependent on o21 o21 is dependent on o11 o11 is dependent on w1 okay so here i can basically write derivative of loss derivative of loss with respect to derivative of o31 then multiplied by derivative of o31 divided by derivative of o21 then multiplied by derivative of o21 divided by o21 is dependent on o11 right o11 and then again multiplied by derivative of o11 divided by derivative of w1 hold so this is one this is the first path right now in the second path i will be adding one more that is the lower path right the lower path will be what over here lower path is again derivative of loss dependent on o31 o31 is dependent on o22 o22 is dependent on o11 o11 is dependent on w1 very simple right so here i will basically write derivative of loss derivative of loss is dependent on o31 plus sorry multiplied since we are doing chain rule then o31 is dependent on o22 so now i will change this derivative of o31 is dependent on derivative of o22 then again we'll try to multiply this derivative of o22 is dependent on o11 right so derivative of o22 derivative of o22 is dependent on derivative of o11 and finally derivative of o11 is dependent on derivative of w1 old right so we have to add this both up and then we will be able to get the solution for the weight updation formula in the backward propagation so this usually happens in the backward propagation who does this task there is something called as optimizers we'll discuss about this in depth but i really wanted to make you understand about what exactly is chain rule of differentiation and this is what exactly chain rule of differentiation is right so we basically call this as chain rule of derivatives right chain rule of derivatives okay so i hope everybody is able to understand this i'm going very slowly making you understand in depth the mathematics everything with all the graphs see in front of you i've written four pages right so i hope uh, can you get give me a like something put some proper comments if you are able to understand and i hope you are able to understand in a better way okay now we'll go to the next topic okay so i hope everybody has understood about the chain rule of differentiation okay so uh, the next topic that we are probably going to discuss about is something called as vanishing gradient problem okay so vanishing gradient problem is a major major problem it's a major major problem which we will try to see to it okay so the next topic uh, that i am going to cover is something called as vanishing gradient problem okay so let me see which uh, this is basically third okay third coming to the vanishing gradient problem okay so number 3 is basically called as vanishing gradient problem okay now what happens in the vanishing gradient problem okay now one very very important thing that you really need to understand okay what exactly is vanishing gradient a super important interview question okay super super important interview question now let's say i have a very deep neural network like this very deep neural network which looks like this okay so this is a very deep neural network okay suppose i say this is my x1 my this is my weights w1 this is my weights w2 w3 w4 and finally i get my output which is my y hat and the loss function now i'm first time writing a loss function formula which is basically called as mean squared error so mean squared error formula is 1 by 2 y minus y hat whole square okay we'll discuss about this what exactly is mean squared error and all i hope everybody knows which activation function initially we are discussing about we are discussing about sigmoid activation function sigmoid activation function 
Now there are some properties of sigmoid activation function. Sigmoid activation functions gives you value with respect to zero or one. Okay, it gives you value with zero and one. What is this loss function? This loss function is MSE mean squared error. We'll discuss about this. Okay, just in some time we'll discuss in completely depth. We'll understand every maths. I'll not leave out any even a single maths in this. Okay, now uh, let's let's. Uh, let's consider this neural network so i have this specific neural network now in this neural network we need to understand two important things okay which uh, which is super important for any interview okay so over here as you know we will be basically adding bias 1 here bias 2 here bias 3 right here bias 4 here bias 5 so bias will be getting added in every hidden layer which i have already discussed up right let's say that uh, the output the output for this layer is nothing but o21 for this it is o31 for o41 and this is basically my o51 let's say i have this many outputs right now tell me in order to update w1 how will i write the formula or uh, my weight updation formula that also we have discussed again i'm revising it clearly to you w1 new is equal to w1 old minus learning rate of derivative of loss with respect to derivative of w1 mu okay this is the formula i hope everybody knows this i have written it 10 times now okay now let's go to the next step if i write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of derivative of w1 new then how will i write the chain rule the chain rule will be very simple so i will write derivative of loss with respect to derivative of o51 okay multiplied by o51 is now dependent on o41 so i will write derivative of loss derivative of loss with respect to derivative of o41 then i will go ahead sorry this will be derivative of o51 derivative of o51 divided by derivative of o41 okay so here will be o41 multiplied by derivative of o41 divided by derivative of o31 and then derivative of o31 divided by derivative of o21 okay multiplied by derivative of o21 divided by derivative of w1 so i hope everybody is getting clear with this so this will be my chain rule to in order to update w1 okay very much clear now what will be my next step in this what what i have to actually do now see one thing very important thing the kind of activation function we use in each and every layer we use an activation function which is called as sigmoid activation function and i hope everybody knows how what a sigmoid activation function formula is it is nothing but one plus e to the power of minus x okay so this is the sigmoid activation formula and we know our output is either zero or one okay zero or one where i specifically say if it is greater than 0.5 then it is going to be one if it is less than 0.5 it is going to be zero now let's let's draw this okay now so my sigmoid activation function curve looks something like this okay it looks something like this okay my value will be between zero to one let's say this is my uh this is my uh if I probably say y is equal to w transpose x plus b, this is my y, okay? This is 0.5, okay? And with respect to this, this is my uh, z value, okay? Z I can consider as my, up after applying an activation function like this, okay? So it will be z is equal to, okay? This is my z. Now over here, you know that this will be all your negative values. This will be your positive values, right? This is fine, okay? I hope we know about this one important property of this sigmoid activation function whenever we try to find out whenever we try to find out the derivative of sigmoid it will be ranging between 0 to 0.25 so my derivative curve will be looking like this okay it will be looking like this my derivative curve will be looking like this and it will always be ranging between 0 to 0.25. Remember, this yellow line is nothing but derivative. Whenever I find out the derivative of this equation, it will always be ranging between 0 to 0.25. So if I write 0 is less than or equal to sigmoid of sigmoid of y, okay, is always being ranging between 0 to 0.25. This is basically my derivative condition. Okay, so I'm going to basically write it as derivative condition. 
okay now because of this because of this okay because of this what will happen just understand over here if i talk about these derivatives since i'm taking o41 o31 o21 o51 can you tell me that in each and every value sigmoid is getting used because if i probably take let's say if i if i if i probably take uh, what is o51 o51 is nothing but we apply an activation function on top of o41 multiplied by w4 and add a bias so on top of it we apply an activation function right so everywhere we are using the sigmoid activation function right now since we are using the sigmoid activation function everywhere in the back propagation when i'm finding the derivative tell me the value will always be ranging between 0 to 0.25 right it will always be ranging between 0 to 0.25 yes so in the backward propagation when i'm finding the derivative with respect to o51 with respect to anything or o41 everywhere sigmoid activation function is getting used and because of the sigmoid activation function we have understood that the derivative of sigmoid activation function always ranges between 0 to 0.25 now what will happen now see in this particular case let's say for this my derivative i got it as 0.25 let's take as an example okay let's take as an example because anyhow my values will be ranging between 0 to 0.25 and it will be like that that i keep on updating this values and this value will keep on decreasing somewhere okay it will keep on decreasing like let's say point uh, point one zero then 0.05 then 0 0.02 then like this it will keep on decreasing because as we are going to this chain rule right as we are going to calculate the derivative always we are trying to get this particular value and it is always going to get reduced right until we go to the end of the chain now one very important thing what will happen because of this since we are multiplying with smaller values don't you think we will be getting a very small value okay we will be getting a very small value the answer is yes we will definitely be getting a very small value now what happens if we get a very small value over here what happens if we get a very small value i will go and update my weight formula no so now it will be w new is equal to w old minus learning rate which is again a small number which is again a small number multiplied by a small number now when i multiply this small number then what will happen what will happen with this small number this at one point of time let's say at one point of time suppose if i say this w new will be approximately equal to w old it will hardly change and if it is hardly changing then what is basically happening w weights are not getting updated and this situation where weights are not getting updated or it is just getting updated by a smaller value this problem is basically called as a vanishing gradient problem this is called as a vanishing gradient problem now how to solve this vanishing gradient problem it is approximately equal right my w new and w old are approximately equal and that is the reason over here no change in the weights are happening no change in weights and this specifically thing is called as vanishing gradient problem and how to basically solve this use another activation function use another activation function that is the reason why we came up with another activation function there are so many different kind of activation function now let me note down all the activation functions that we are going to learn after this the first activation function i hope everybody knows about it is nothing but sigmoid but the second activation function that we are going to know learn is tan h okay which we'll discuss about third activation function which we are going to discuss about is relu then fourth activation function we'll discuss about is pre relu like leaky relu sorry not pre relu it is leaky relu leaky relu and similarly we will be discussing about pre relu pre relu and different different activation functions okay so let's go ahead and let's try to see about the activation function and what is the best activation function we can actually use that we are going to see okay so i'm going to share my screen with you again a proper screen uh, can you quickly tell me whether you are able to see my screen or not just quick confirmation i hope everybody is able to see okay so this is my sigmoid activation function okay so let me open another pen for you so that i can write on top of it okay but 
can i get a quick confirmation you are able to understand everything yes you are able to understand everything or not very much clearly yeah yes okay now if you are able to understand as usual as i always say please hit like and uh, that will actually boost my energy okay and it will help me to teach you much more better okay okay now let's go ahead for discussing the first activation function which is called as sigmoid i've told you in the left hand side that you basically see this is the functionality this is the functionality of the activation function on the left hand side this is basically the derivative okay this is basically the derivative whenever we are doing the back propagation so in the activation function sigmoid activation function we have seen it will be ranging between 0 to 1 and this is the formula which we have already seen if i want to find out the derivative of sigmoid activation function it will be ranging between 0 to 0.25 because of which vanishing gradient problem exists vanishing gradient problem exists this we have clearly understood okay and this is a major issue over here and this material will also be shared in the github or in the dashboard uh, that uh, the link is given in the description okay so there you can basically check out okay now let's understand some of the important properties of sigmoid activation function okay what all things are there and based on that what all disadvantage are there we'll try to understand okay so now first thing advantages of sigmoid activation function smooth gradient prevents jump in output value so you know that here in the sigmoid activation function we have the smooth gradient right so because of this the convergence will be quickly done and will help us to work in a better way okay but always remember this point the input the function output is not centered on zero which will reduce the efficiency of the weight update now what is this centered not zero now see guys suppose if i have a curve if i have a curve let's say uh if i have a curve which looks like this when i say it is centered to zero suppose if there is a curve that passes which which passes like this which passes through the mean that is zero which passes through the origin okay and over here you can see that there will be negative values there will be positive values also right during this particular scenario we say this curve as zero centered curve zero centered curve okay so whenever we have a zero centered curve the weight updation becomes very much easy okay it, it it efficiently updates the weight okay so in this particular case it is not passing through zero so definitely this is not zero centered okay that is the exact meaning of zero center perfect so if you have understood till here i hope uh, we'll go to the next step and we'll try to understand the disadvantage also into this and i will be giving you this material so that you can read it through it okay now when the input slightly is slightly away from the coordinate origin the gradient of the uh, function becomes very small that is almost zero okay this is what i talked spoken about right in the back propagation right back propagation so here you can see in the process of neural network back propagation we all use chain rule of differential to calculate the differential of each weight when the back propagation passes through the sigmoid function the dif differential on the chain is very small and because of that vanishing gradient problem exists okay now the function output is not zero centered on zero which will reduce the efficiency of weight update this also i have actually told you the sigmoid function performs exponentially operation which is slower for computers now what is this exponential operation this is the operation that is there the formula for sigmoid is nothing but 1 plus 1 uh, 1 divided by 1 plus e to the power of minus x this is exactly an exponential function and whenever we need to perform this operation it takes time the time complexity increases since there is an exponential function okay so this is a major issue some of the issues with uh, respect to sigmoid activation function okay now let's go to the next one sigmoid what are the advantages of sigmoid smoother gradient prevents jumping output values between 0 and 1 so normalizing the output of each neuron clear prediction very close to 1 or 0 this all are things are there but here you see major three uh, disadvantage it is prone to gradient descent uh, sorry gradient vanishing 
function output is not zero centered power operation are relatively time consuming okay so don't worry i will after this class i will upload the materials in the dashboard okay now now in order to promo, uh, prevent this the researchers will not keep quiet because obviously uh, if there is a vanishing gradient problem we cannot create a deep neural network right we cannot do this we cannot create a deep neural network it is very very difficult so what we what do we do in this particular case so what do we do in this particular case so here i will go down now now the second activation function that we usually use is something called as tan h okay tan h uh, it is also called as hyperbolic tangent function now in hyperbolic tangent function the formula looks something like this e to the power of x minus e to the power of minus x divided by e to the power of x plus e to the power of minus x now here you can see that my value two main important my value ranges between minus 1 to plus 1 in tanh function whenever i apply a tanh activation function my value will be ranging between minus 1 to plus 1 and in the case of derivative it will be ranging between 0 to 1 right so in the derivative in the derivative side yes any time we find out the derivative it will be ranging between 0 to 1 right in the previous case when we were using sigmoid there it was ranging between 0 to 0.25 right which is pretty much better now because my value is basically ranging between 0 to 1 but does this prevent vanishing gradient problem still there will be a issue right guys if we go on constructing a deep neural network deep deep neural network at one point of time there may be chances that vanishing gradient problem still exist right so because of that we should also not use tanh function but this was the second activation function that researcher came up with because the first activation function still had that issue and this had issues of vanishing gradient but after a uh, when we are actually constructing a very deep neural network okay so i hope everybody has understood this specific thing okay and please remember the formula the derivative whenever you try to find out the derivative of this curve you'll always be getting the value between 0 to 1 okay this is zero centric see that zero centric problem is also solved over here this is also ha having zero centric which is better than sigmoid it is written over here okay so tanh is a hyperbolic tangent function the curves of tanh function and sigmoid function are very relatively sm smaller let's compare them first of all when the input is large or the output is also smooth the gradient is small which is conducive to weight update the difference is the output interval uh, the whole zero centric which is better than sigmoid Uh, in binary classification problem we basically use tan tanh functions for the hidden layer and sigmoid for the output layer okay so i hope everybody is able to understand but still i said that there will be chances of vanishing gradient problem so now what to do what do we do we cannot keep quiet there will be another researcher who will be doing his phd so he has to come up with new equations and he has to come up with new research and probably the next activation function is an amazing activation function and right now it is the most popular activation function which is being used by any everyone without any knowledge if that person does not have any knowledge also then also he'll be using that activation function and that activation function is nothing but relu okay relu activation function or uh, relu activation function for uh, full form is rectified linear unit which you can see over here rectified uni linear unit over here the formula is nothing but max 0 comma x either it will be zero or whatever value the x is if the x value is negative then it will be zero okay whenever the x value is negative whenever we apply this relu activation function on top of it it becomes zero whenever it is positive it will come to that same positive value suppose if the x value is 1 then i'm going to get 1 if the x value is 2 i'm going to get 2 if the x value is 3 i'm going to get 3 right so this is pretty much amazing and whenever i try to find out the derivative of relu the value is either 0 or 1 okay 0 or 1 now this is again a major concern guys because let's say if one of the weights during the derivative right when we are updating the weights if it becomes zero this neuron the neurons that i have right suppose let's say this is my hidden layer one neuron this will become dead dead during the back propagation right in the forward propagation also in the forward propagation it's fine it will not do anything but in the back propagation also when i'm trying to find out a derivative the value is either zero or one right the value is either 0 or 1 if it becomes 0 in the back propagation that entire derivative chain rule right this will become 0 right when this is becoming 0 w new will be approximately equal to w old right 
This will be approximately equal to zero. That basically means that neuron will be completely dead. This is one disadvantage of ReLU activation function. Other than that, this is solving or this is doing an exceptional, exceptional performance because over here, just imagine over here, you don't have any exponential operation also. Here, you just have this simple operation, which is pretty much quicker than the previous one. Okay. So here you don't have any, it is obviously better than sigmoid. It is obviously solving the vanishing gradient problem. It is obviously solving the other problems that it had. Uh, it is also solving the tannage function problem. It is not zero centric. It is not zero centric over here. Just see, it is just passing through zero, but we are not getting any negative values. It is not zero centric. This is only the one disadvantage that it has. Other than that, everything that it has, it has better than sigmoid and uh, tannage activation function. Okay, so I hope you are able to understand this part also where we have specifically discussed about ReLU activation function. Now let's read about it. A ReLU function is actually a function that takes the maximum value. Note that this is not fully interval derivable. We have we can take subgradient. Uh, it is an activation function that is currently more popular. When the input is positive, there is no gradient saturation problem. The calculation speed is much more faster. The ReLU function has a linear relationship, whether it is forward or backward, it is much faster than sigma and tanh. Okay, there are some disadvantage when the input is negative, ReLU is completely inactive, which means once a negative number is entered, ReLU will die. Okay, ReLU will die. Okay, so and it is also not zero centric. So you can, I will be giving you this entire materials in the description, uh, probably after the session, you can check it out. Okay, now in order to solve this dead ReLU or dead neuron, Okay, we have another activation function which we call it as leaky ReLU function and only one thing is basically getting changed where they are not saying that it will be 0 but it will be 0 0.01 multiplied by that x value. So now my value will be little bit coming like this in leaky ReLU. See, in leaky ReLU it will be something coming like this and it will be going like this. Now in this particular case, I will be having some negative values, it will never be 0. In this particular case also, whenever I'm trying to find out a derivative, it will never be zero and it will be a small number over here. You can see over here and over here, right? So this is important, right? This is specifically important. So leaky ReLU function solves the dead neuron problem. Dead neuron problem that was basically happening in ReLU. Okay. I hope everybody is able to understand very much simply okay so remember this formula and then we will be able to understand this perfect so and then i'll also tell you which which activation function you should use blindly for what kind of scenario you have to use blindly everything i'll talk about it uh, once i complete all this activation function so in order to solve the dead relu problem people propose to set the first half of the relu as 0.01x instead of 0 another intuitive idea is a parameter based method where we can also supply parameters not only 0.01 but some other parameters also, okay? Some other parameters also. So here it is. Um, in theory, leaky ReLU has the advantages of ReLU, plus there will be no problem with dead ReLU, but actual operation, it is not fully proved. They are also saying that it is not fully proved, but yes, people use that specific option also, okay? Now, let's go to the next step, which is called as exponential linear units, okay? Now in exponential linear units, we have a different formula. Whenever the x value is greater than zero, we have x, otherwise we apply this particular operation over there. So we will be getting this kind of curve, but always remember in the derivative also, you can see we are also able to get this exponential curve. And again, the value will be ranging between zero to one. Again, no dead ReLU issue. This means uh, the output is close to zero, zero centered. One small problem that it is slightly more expens uh, computationally expensive because we are using exponential value. Okay. Only this many things are there. There are small minute, minute changes which people do use. Softmax will discuss this in activation function. But uh, let's see one more. There is also something called as pre-ReLU. Pre-ReLU, just by seeing the diagram, you'll be able to understand what we are, they are trying to do. Okay, so instead of directly having this, we will be having in this way, okay, which solves the problem. Okay, so here W of i, W of i is greater than zero. If it is less than or is equal to zero, we are we multiply a constant. 
Okay. So if A of I is zero, it becomes ReLU. If A of I is greater than zero, it becomes leaky ReLU. If A of I is a learnable parameter, it becomes pre ReLU. So in learnable parameters, this will keep on changing. Okay. This will keep on changing. That is the only difference. Okay. And then there is also another activation function, which is called as switch, a self-gated function. I think uh, this is uh, brought by Google itself. Uh, another activation function over here. Swish, Swish and ReLU. Uh, in this particular case, we have this kind of curve. One problem is that we cannot find out the derivative of zero. Okay. But you can use any kind of activation function. But in short, if I go with respect to using any activation function, let's see how do we go ahead with. Okay. So what is the funda or what is the technique to understand which activation function we should use? Technique, which activation function we should use? which activation function we should use. Okay. Which activation function we should use. Now the technique should be very simple. Okay. You know that you cannot use sigmoid activation function. Okay. If you use sigmoid activation function, what will happen? Vanishing gradient problem will happen. Right. It is very much clear. Vanishing gradient problem will be there. You cannot use tan H. There are also vanishing gradient. So, Suppose you have binary classification. Suppose you have binary classification. Now in binary classification, the funda will be that. Suppose this is your neural network. Okay. Let's say this is your neural network and this is your output. Let's say this is your entire neural network. Okay. Now in this particular case, always remember in the hidden layer, try to use ReLU activation function. In the hidden layer, always use ReLU activation function. It is the most efficient activation function. Okay, ReLU activation function. In the output layer, if this is a binary classification problem, use sigmoid activation function. Sigmoid activation function. Okay, this should be the funda. Let's say, with the help of ReLU, Okay, with the help of ReLU, the convergence is not happening. That activation function, the convergence is not happening. Then what will happen? You can change this ReLU to something called as pre-ReLU or ELU. Right? You can change this. But always remember, whenever you are doing a binary classification problem, your output should have the sigmoid activation function only. Okay? Sigmoid activation function. Now, Let's talk about multi-class classification problem. In multi-class classification problem, suppose this is my neurons and this is my hidden layer and this is my, let's say two output are there. Now in the case of multi-class classification problem, okay, in the case of multi-class classification problem, use another activation function which is called as Softmax. I'll discuss about softmax just in a while when we are discussing about loss function. So softmax activation function can be used over here in the output layer. Over here again, you can use the combination of ReLU or pre-ReLU or other kind of ReLU if the convergence is not happening. But by default, always make sure that go with ReLU. Okay. ReLU solves most of the problem. Right. So that is the reason in each and every hidden layer, in each and every neuron, use ReLU activation function in hidden layers. In output layer for multi-class, use softmax activation function or sigma activation function. Now, in the case of regression problem statement, in the case of regression problem statement, what can you use in the case of regression problem statement? In regression problem statement, again, the funda will be same. Okay. Suppose this is the hidden layer and this is the output layer. Regression basically means you will be having a continuous value. I hope everybody knows machine learning, right? A basic of machine learning. Now in regression case, always remember here in the hidden layer, use ReLU or any variation of ReLU. But in the output layer, use an activation function which is called as linear activation function. Okay linear activation function. So there is another kind of activation function, which is called as linear activation function. And over here, there will be also a separate loss function, which I will be discussing about in just after we complete this activation function. Okay. So guys, 
how was the session till here are you able to understand is it going like a story i hope everybody is able to understand why i am going in this specific way and how i am able to make you understand in this way itself okay now we'll discuss about lost and cost function but please let me know whether did you understand this thing or not okay that is the most important thing uh, are you able to understand because now the next topic that i am actually going to discuss about is something called as activation function so not sorry not activation function it is basically loss function now we are going to deep dive into loss functions okay so everybody is able to understand uh, see i am not seeing anywhere everything is in my mind i am able to teach you directly by writing things okay and that is what i will be doing it yeah anyhow all the materials after the session will be given uh, in the uh, dashboard um, in the description that is given but just follow and probably we'll try to cover loss function today because it is, is important it is super important it is super super important okay now uh let me drink some water quickly okay <laughs> now without wasting any time let's go and see uh the loss functions and uh, we will try to understand what exactly is a loss function and uh what all things we have learned till now i really want to cover everything okay now till now we have seen neural networks like where did loss actually come in this stage right i told you that we should always try to reduce this loss right loss came over here everything after the forward propagation loss will be coming and we need to reduce the loss but there are different types of loss function also that we really need to discuss okay let's say i have a data set or let let's let's talk about this deep learning and deep learning specifically with respect to artificial neural network if i probably say a and n right we solve two different kind of problems the first problem is something called as regression and the second problem that we basically solve is something called as classification okay now whenever we are trying to solve this two basically regression or classification we basically learn uh, these all things over here okay now in regression always understand the data set how it look like let's say uh, i have a data set over here the data set has values like uh, years of experience okay degree okay and the output feature is salary now here if i say the person is 10 years experience and he is having phd the salary will be quite high right so here you will be having a continuous value right so this continuous value is basically my output feature and this is basically a kind of regression problem this is basically a kind of regression problem okay very very simple very very clear okay in the case of bio classification how my data set will look like if i probably see an example with respect to data set let's say uh, it will be like uh, playing hours study hours and whether the person is able to pass or fail okay now this becomes a classification problem it can be a binary classification okay let's say if it is a multi classification suppose the person plays for 10 hours he studies for 2 hours then obviously the chance is that the person may fail right if the person studies for plays for 4 hours and he studies for 3 hour then also i think the person may fail right let's say the person is studying playing for 5 hours and he studying for 5 hours then maybe maybe he may pass and i may have another data set like if the person is playing for 2 hours and if he is studying for 7 hours he may pass so here what is happening here you have a multi class classification problem okay now with respect to this kind of problems you will have different different loss function okay loss function so the first loss function that i am going to discuss about is with respect to regression and the second i will go ahead with discussing classification okay now in regression we discuss basically three different types one is mean squared error 
I'm going to write it down. Mean squared error. And this all will work for a continuous output feature. Okay. Second is mean absolute error. Mean absolute error. Okay. Mean absolute error. The third one that we are basically going to discuss about is something called as Huber loss. Okay. Huber loss. So we are going to basically discuss this three main first for regression and then we will continue for classification. So let's go ahead and let's try to understand what exactly is mean squared error. And before that, I want to discuss about two different things. One is loss function and cost function. Now I'm introducing a new term which is called as cost function. Okay. Let's say guys, this is my input, right? This is my hidden layer and this is my output. Now, usually in forward propagation, let's say in my data set, I have 100 records. Let's say in my data set, I have 100 records. Okay. In my data set, I have 100 records. 100 records. Right. Now, in the, during the forward propagation, what happens? During the forward propagation, what happens? I pass one record. I calculate the y hat and then I calculate the loss and the formula is very simple y minus y hat whole square okay and then I basically do the backward propagation this happens usually for every record we are calculating the loss but this is not an efficient scenario suppose if I have 100 records I can set up a batch size I can basically say at every forward propagation past 10 records and when you are passing the 10 records, then you calculate the loss for the 10 records. Okay. Whenever I pass batch at once, then the formula will be changing. Instead of loss, I will try to write this as cost function. And this cost function will be I is equal to 1 to N, which is my batch size. And this formula will be Y minus Y hat whole square. And here I will be having 1 by 2. Okay, so I hope everybody is able to understand what is the difference between loss and cost function. In loss function, I specifically provide one data point. In cost function, I specifically provide batch of data points. Okay, so this is the basic difference. Okay, in the forward and the backward propagation. In every propagation, in every epoch, we also say it as epochs. We pass a batch of records, not just a single record. Okay, so till here, I hope everybody is clear. But now let's go ahead and let's, let's try to understand what is this mean squared error. So first one that we are going to understand is something called as mean squared error loss function. And this is for regression. Okay. We basically also write it as MSC. Now mean squared error, already I have written the formula. If you go ahead with loss function, the formula is nothing but 1 by 2 y minus y hat whole square. If I probably go with respect to cost function, the formula is summation of i is equal to 1 to n, 1 by 2, y minus, or let me write it like this, little bit like this, so it will be easy. It will be 1 by 2, summation of i is equal to 1 to n, y minus y hat whole square. Okay. So this, this, I hope everybody is able to uh, understand over here. Okay. Very easily you are able to understand the loss function will be written like this. The cost function will be written like this. Okay. But we need to understand what exactly is this mean squared error. This formula that you are able to see. Okay. This formula is basically called as quadratic equation. Quadratic equation. Now what is so special about this quadratic equation? Okay. So. I hope everybody knows this formula a minus b whole square. So you say a square minus 2ab plus b square. This is also a quadratic equation. If you probably want to see a generic definition of quadratic equation, it is nothing but ax square plus bx plus c. Okay. And whenever you construct this quadratic equation, whenever you construct this quadratic equation, you will be able to see that we get a kind of curve, this kind of curve. Okay. Because this is the loss function. And if you remember, this quadratic equation gives us something like this kind of gradient descent. Okay. If you probably go and write plotting a quadratic equation. Okay. Quadratic equation. At that point of time, you will be getting this kind of curve. 
okay now what is this curve here you will be able to see this is my one single point okay this curve this quadratic equation has lot of disadvantage lot of advantages okay so let me note down some of the advantages so first i will go ahead and note down the advantages of this quadratic equation or this uh, curve okay so i will just go and note down all the advantages the first advantage let's discuss about it the first advantage okay the first advantage over here whenever we have this kind of curve that basically means it can be differentiable so it is definitely differentiable that we have already seen right that is how weight updation formula basically happens this curve is basically getting created by this quadratic equation only right so it is obviously differentiable the second thing that you can basically write it has only one global or local minima it has only one local or global minima it has only one not more than one okay it has obviously just one local or global minima the third point you can basically write it converges faster it converges faster so these are some of the amazing advantages of using this but as we say everything that comes up it has pros it has cons so let's talk about the disadvantages disadvantages the first disadvantage that is there and only disadvantage it is not robust to outliers big issue big 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 issue and just by seeing the formula you can actually understand let's say i'm solving a linear regression problem let's say i have a data points which looks like this okay let's say i have an outliers let's say i have this outliers if i remove this outliers obviously you know that my linear regression line that will be getting created it will get created like this okay it will definitely get created like this right it will definitely get created like this over here but now if i have some outliers what will happen just see this i'll remove this line i'll remove this line let's say i'm having some outliers over here then my line that new line that will get created will look like this now why this line changing is happening so much why this line changes so much the reason it changes so much it is because i am penalizing the error this is my error right and that error i'm squaring it the reason it shifts so much because we are penalizing the error okay we are penalizing the error if there are no outliers that is fine but if our errors are too much then we are penalizing them since we are squaring the error over here and because of that the best fit line which you basically have will have a major major shift okay will have a major shift in short right so this is the only disadvantage with respect to the mean squared error that it is not robust to outliers okay now coming to the second one obviously if it is not robust to outliers again researcher will not keep quiet they'll come up with something so coming to the second one which is called as mean absolute error mean absolute error now what exactly is mean absolute error i'll just write it down as formula okay so over here my loss function formula will be 1 by 2 absolute of y minus y hat or cost function will basically be 1 by 2 summation of i is equal to 1 to n y minus y hat right this is how it will be now we are not squaring it so definitely the major advantage will be that it is it is what is the major advantage it is robust to outliers because now we are not penalizing we are squaring it sorry we are not squaring it so we are not penalizing for that specific error we are taking the absolute value right so this is the major advantage with respect to the mean uh, absolute error so that basically means even though i have a kind of outlier let's say like this suppose these are my points and suppose if i have some outliers there will be a shift but not a major shift the shift may be this much 
initially the line may be simple then what you'll be there'll be a there'll be a minor shift okay and how does this mean absolute error curve look like this curve will be looking something like this like how we had for quadratic equation the curve for mean absolute error will be like this and for this the derivative will not be simple we have to basically take sub gradient sub gradient basically means we need to divide this line separate part by part and basically calculate the slope that is what it is you know because here we don't have any kind of curve we have to take part by part because this keeps on changing it it can change from one part to the other part right so here we have to basically take the sub gradient to basically calculate or update the weights not a major task but it does take little bit time it is time consuming time constraint is there so timing timing wise obviously it is more than the previous one that is mean squared error okay now coming to the third one the third one for the linear regression is something called as huber loss huber loss in short is the combination of mean squared error and it is the combination of mean absolute error okay mean squared error and means absolute error now here the loss will look something like this the loss or the cost function will look something like this so here you can write 1 by 2 y minus y hat whole square and this is specifically this will be specifically when it will be used when the outliers are not there right so if i write a condition if y minus if y minus y hat is less than or equal to some hyperparameter which is basically given by this delta sign so this will be some hyperparameter okay so i will basically write this as an hyperparameter if the difference is less than this value if the error difference is less than this value then probably i will go with this because this will denote whether there is an outlier or not present in this and if in the second case it will be something like we will be taking care of y minus y hat minus half by delta square otherwise so if there are outliers we will specifically use this same hyperparameter and we'll use this equation to solve that so two condition one is basically when the when the outliers are not present when the outliers are not present are not present and if the outliers are present we can definitely use this one and this is specifically a hyperparameter which can be found out when we are doing the coding okay so this is specifically to huber loss so till here everybody is clear because we have discussed mean squared error mean absolute error and huber loss for the regression now we will go ahead and discuss about the classification one so the next topic is with respect to classification loss function what are the different different classification loss function we will try to discuss and tomorrow we will discuss optimizers optimizers will definitely take more time to cover and uh, you will be able to understand that in a better way okay so i hope everybody is clear till here if you if you are liking this session please give a heart symbol something motivate me energize me and that way we'll be able to learn many things okay and still another 15 minutes will be taking and it will get completed okay so let's go ahead now in classification we specifically use something called as cross entropy cross entropy this cross entropy usually is loss function is for two types one is for binary classification and the second one is for i'll write like this there are two types of this okay uh, okay sorry for cost function you can basically write summation of i is equal to 1 to n okay i think that you can basically do okay it's it's very simple okay now in classification uh, i basically have a binary cross entropy and i have categorical cross entropy okay now in binary cross entropy we basically do it for binary classification for the multi class classification problem we use categorical cross entropy okay 
So this is what we basically use for all these things. And, uh, uh, you know, we will go ahead with the formula and uh, we'll try to see. Binary cross entropy, I hope everybody has learned about logistic regression. Just comment down whether you have learned logistic regression or not. The logistic regression, whatever loss function is used, right? That log loss. Similarly, that is used for the binary cross entropy. So let me just write it down. So for first, binary cross entropy. Okay. We, we actually use a loss function which will be which will be a log loss function which is given by minus y log of y hat minus 1 minus y multiplied by log of 1 minus y hat okay this is the loss that is used in logistic regression also because logistic regression is a binary classification problem okay if i and this is basically called as log loss okay log loss I can also write this in a different format. So my loss function will look something like this now. Minus log 1 minus y hat if y is equal to 0. Minus log y hat if y is equal to 1. Okay. That basically means whenever this y is 0, whenever this y is 0, right? Whenever this y is 0, then what will happen? We just, uh, you can see 0 multiplied by this will be 0. 1 minus 0 is nothing but. So we have this minus log 1 minus y hat. Okay. And then I have log of y hat if y is equal to 1. y is equal to 1 basically means this entire thing will become 0. So I'll be having minus log of y hat. But the question rises. This is basically for the log loss. How do we calculate y hat? The y hat calculation is very simple, right? We basically use the sigmoid activation function. Right? Sigmoid activation function in the last layer. This is how we basically come up with y hat. For y, we definitely, then we apply this log loss on top of it and then we do the back propagation. Everybody is clear with that, okay? And this is specifically for binary classification. Binary classification. And that is the power of binary cross entropy, okay? Now, the next thing that we are going to discuss about is coming to the next one. Uh, let's discuss about this categorical cross entropy. Okay, so the second one is categorical cross entropy. A categorical cross entropy is nothing but it is a multi class classification problem. Okay, multi class classification problem. Now, in the case of categorical cross entropy, what will happen? Let's say I have some features. Let's say I have a data set like F1, F2, F3 and I have output something, okay? Let's say some values are there, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, some value in the data set, and my output is good, bad, normal, neutral, let's say, okay? I have this specific output. Now, the first thing in categorical cross entropy, what we do, whatever output, since this is a multi-class classification problem, right? Multi-class classification problem. First of all, what we do is that we convert this into a one hot encoded format. One hot encoded format basically means what happens for this output. Now I will be having columns like good, bad, neutral. This is the first step that we do. Wherever the good value is, that becomes one and remaining all becomes zero. Wherever bad is there, that will become one and remaining all will be zero. Wherever neutral is there, that will become one and remaining all will be zero. Okay. So this is the first step. Okay. And for this, what is the loss function for categorical cross entropy? Okay, for multi-class classification. We can write loss is equal to x of i comma y of i. Okay. And here, I'll, I'll make you understand the formula. Let me write down the formula. Summation of j is equal to 1 to j is equal to 1 to c. c basically means number of categories. Okay. y of ij multiplied by log to the base e y of ij hat okay and this is just the formula okay for the loss function now let me make you understand what this exactly loss function is basically saying okay and what all things are uh, basically coming out of this information from this everything right we'll, we'll try to understand so let's consider let's consider whenever i write in this way see whenever i write 
y of i. Let's say I'm writing y of i. y of i for the first row, for the first row, first row, this row. Let's say this is my first row, right? How do I denote it? How do I denote it? I may write, okay, y of i1. y of i1 is nothing but this first one. For the first row, this is y of i1, y of i2, y of i3. i is nothing but row. i is equal to row. j is nothing but column, okay? I will just talk about it, okay? i is equal to row and j is equal to top. So if I write y of i1, comma y of i2, comma y of i3, last will be going to y of i c. Okay, IC basically means number of categories. Okay, now if I write with respect to Y of IJ, then two things will be coming. See, one, if the element, if the element is in class, what does this basically mean? Over here, if good is present, then this will become one. Remaining all will become zero. Okay, if, if bad is present over here, this will only become one. Remaining all will be zero. So here we are basically writing one if the element is in class, zero otherwise. This is how we calculate this y hat, y of ij. This y of ij, we basically find out in this way. So here is what I am getting my y of ij. But how do I get my y of i ha, ij hat? Now we have calculated this, right? We got this y of ij. We are able to find it out. But what about y of ij? Now y of ij is basically got through another activation function which is called as softmax activation function this softmax activation function i told you it is applied in the output layer for multiple classification problem right everybody remembers that and what is the formula of this what is the formula of this the formula is very simple it is nothing but we basically say softmax of any z value is nothing but e of z of i summation of j is equal to 1 to k e of zj i will i will explain this thing also i will explain this thing also let's say i have a neural network i have a neural network which has two hidden layers sorry two output layer this is my output one this is my output two let's say before i have three hidden neuron okay in this layer i had three hidden neuron so this will all get connected right this will all get connected Yes. Now over here, you know, weights will get assigned, right? Here weights will get assigned. Let's say the values that I'm actually getting after multiplying through the weights are something like this. Let's say I'm getting over here 10, 20, 30, something like this or 40, right? Let's say I'm getting like this and this is 50. Now, in order to find out the output over here, what I will do is that I will apply this softmax activation function. Now, this will be what? Suppose I want to calculate for this, for this particular thing. So E of J of I, let's say E of J of I, if I want to calculate for this, let's say it will be uh, E of J of I, let's say for this first thing. For this, how much, what will be my probability? So I'll write E of E to the power of 10 divided by E to the power of 10 plus 20 plus 30 plus 40 plus 50, right? And whenever I try to find out this, this I will be getting in the form of probability like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. But always remember, both this probability summation will be equal to 1. Whichever will be the higher probability, that class output will be coming up. Right? And this activation function is called as softmax activation function. This is basically applied in every output layer. Every, every output layer. Okay? For a multi-class classification problem. Right? So, I hope everybody is able to understand. Okay? Now, I want you all to understand this for multi-classification problem, how we are basically under applying softmax activation in the output layer. For binary classification problem, we are applying sigmoid activation function. This is the thinking you should basically be knowing because tomorrow if I'm coding and showing you how things are basically there, okay, how things are basically working, you can basically understand, okay, if it is a binary classification problem, I'll basically be using a ReLU activation function. And then in the output layer, I'll be using a sigmoid activation function. Suppose it is a multi-class classification problem. In the middle layers, I'll be using ReLU. In the outside, in the output layer, I'll basically be using a softmax activation function. So again, let me repeat the conclusions out of all these sessions, of all this today's session, what all things we learned. Let's say, what, what all things we learned, okay? Just tell me the answer, okay? Suppose, 
I use ReLU in middle layer and a softmax in the output layer. This becomes a multi-class classification problem, right? Multi-class classification problem. I can also use pre-ReLU. I can also use this. If I use ReLU and sigmoid, then this becomes a binary classification problem, right? And loss function, what it will be used over here? Obviously, you know that sigmoid activation function will be used over there, right? ReLU in the hidden layer, right? In the hidden layer. Similarly, this is for binary classification. For, li for linear regression, what do we do? We apply a little bit change, right? In linear regression, we will definitely use ReLU. But in the output layer, we have now linear activation function. And what is the loss that I apply over here? It will be MSE or MAE, right? Or it may be Huber loss, right? Over here, what I apply for multi-class? It will be categorical cross entropy, loss function. Right, and for this, it will be binary cross entropy loss function. I guess everybody is able to understand, guys. Yes or no? I know I've taken today a lot one hour 40 minutes, it is a holiday, but I'm extremely sorry, I needed to complete this. But uh, if you are able to understand, please hit like and yes, to share with everyone, guys. And today, we are ending this session now. What all things we learned? So many things we learned, right? We completed activation function. We completed everything, right? So what all things we learned? We finished forward propagation, chain rule of derivative, vanishing gradient form, loss function. And then we also understood activation functions, right? So all these things is basically completed, right? So did you enjoy the lesson? Yeah, it was amazing, I guess. You are able to understand. Yeah, perfect. Uh, now, see, this is the thing. Whenever, if you, if you are probably enrolled, see guys, if you go to iNeuron.ai, right? Here, you will be able to find community classes in DL community. The link is also given in the description, okay? So here you can see my photo. If you go to the course, here all the videos plus materials will get uploaded. Suppose if I'm going and seeing introduction to deep learning, the video is here. If I go to the resources, the resources are here. So here you'll be able to download the entire resource. Okay, so this is the yesterday's class resource. Now today, as soon as the class will get over, I will provide all the materials that I have used today and I'll be uploading till tomorrow, right? So please do that specific part from your side, okay? And tomorrow's we are going to discuss about optimizers, okay? Uh, optimizer will be quite fun. Hit like, uh, make it 400. And please guys, uh, today only hardly 400 people uh, came up. Uh, again, it is a loss of the people. It is not loss of mine. Uh, I've, I've, I've taught so in depth, one and a half hour class, you know, one hour, 40 minutes, okay? So please, uh, and these all are interview questions, guys. They will definitely ask you all this kind of interview question. So how would you like to rate out of 10? Uh, you can definitely rate me. And uh, if you like my session, definitely like it. Take up membership plans from my YouTube channel. Support my YouTube channel. Uh, share it with all uh, everyone you can, you know. Uh, that is how we can basically grow it. And please make sure that you subscribe my Hindi channel in the pinned comment, okay? Please make sure that you do that. Uh, it will be very, very helpful. In the pinned comment in the live chat, you'll be able to see my Hindi channel. There also I'm uploading data science videos. Uh, this was it from my side. Uh, I hope you liked this session. All the materials will be available. Please make sure that you join the uh, community session. The dashboard link is given in the description. This was it. Uh, happy Eid from everyone to everyone. Uh, you know, uh, and yes, please do come tomorrow, more number of people, share it everywhere, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, wherever, whatever groups that you have, please do that. It will be helpful for me also. And that interest part will be coming up more and more. Okay. So tomorrow we are going to discuss about optimizers. And once we complete optimizers, we can see some examples of how to implement an ANN and probably we'll come try to complete it tomorrow itself. Okay. So thank you guys. Uh, have a great day. Keep on rocking. Keep on learning. Never give up. Try to help others. And yes, do share my